woe is now before them, apparently defenseless in the presence of the monarch of Israel, the prophets of Baal, the men of war, and the surrounding thousands. But Elijah is not alone. Above and around him are the protecting hosts of heaven, angels that excel in strength. While Israel on Carmel doubt and hesitate, the voice of Elijah again breaks the silence. I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are four hundred and fifty men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answered by fire, let him be God. The morning passes, noon comes, and yet there is no evidence that Bill hears the cries of his deluded followers. There is no voice, no reply to their frantic prayers. The sacrifice remains unconsumed. One suggests one thing, and another something else, until finally they cease their efforts. Reminding the people of the long-continued apostasy that has awakened the wrath of Jehovah, Elijah calls upon them to humble their hearts and turn to the God of their fathers, that the curse upon the land of Israel may be removed. Then, bowing reverently before the unseen God, he raises his hands toward heaven and offers a simple prayer. Whilst priests have screamed and foamed and leaped from early morning until late in the afternoon, but as Elijah prays, no senseless shrieks resound over Carmel's height. He prays as if he knows Jehovah is there, a witness to the scene, a listener to his appeal. The prophets of Baal have prayed wildly and coherently. Elijah prays simply and fervently, asking God to show his superiority over Baal, that Israel may be led to turn to him. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, the prophet pleads, Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. 1 Kings 18 36, 37 No sooner is the prayer of Elijah ended than flames of fire, like brilliant flashes of lightning, descend from heaven upon the upreared altar, consuming the sacrifice licking up the water in the trench, and consuming even the stones of the altar. The people on the mount prostrate themselves in awe before the unseen God. They cry out together as with one voice, The Lord, He is the God, the Lord, He is the God. At last the people see how greatly they have dishonored God. The character of Baal worship in contrast with the reasonable service required by the true God, stands fully revealed. The people recognize God's justice and mercy in withholding the dew and the rain until they have been brought to confess his name. They are ready now to admit that the God of Elijah is above every idol. Elijah said to Ahab, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Then the prophet went to the top of the mount to pray. From the top of the mountain, one can look out over the blue Mediterranean Sea and observe the northwestern sky, the direction from which most of Israel's rain comes. Elijah's persistence in sending his servant seven times to look for rain was rewarded with his announcement after those years of drought. Behold the cloud, as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. 1 Kings 43, 44 The cloud grew, and grew until the entire sky was filled with dark rain clouds. Suddenly it began to rain, and the terrible drought ended. I Kings 18, 42-45
In the Carmelite tradition, Elijah and Mary are brought together most closely in the image of the cloud that forms over the sea. Mary is the cloud that rises out of the sea. The sea is all to water, undrinkable, a vast body of water, next to which the kingdom can still thirst and die. The sea is salty, impure, an image of fallen humanity with its sad mixture of sin. Mary rises out of the sea, pure and perfect, laden with the water of grace, that will pour out through her to all humanity not the source of grace herself, nevertheless the container into which all is poured until it overflows out to all people, limitless, and life-giving. Our Lady of Mount Carmel is also known as Star of the Sea a title that developed out of the little cloud that rose from the sea as Elijah prayed. Cresip bus of Jerusalem called her the cloud of rain that offers drink to the souls of the saints. Carmelite sought refuge in the Queen of Saints in times of need and Simon Stock, then Prior General sought the special intercession daily. He sang, O most beautiful flower of Mount Carmel, fruitful vine, splendor of heaven, blessed mother of the Son of God, immaculate virgin, assist me in this my necessity. O star of the sea, help me and show me herein you are my mother. O show me herein you are my mother. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. On July 16, 1251, Mary appeared to Simon Stock surrounded by angels and holding in her hands the brown scapular of the Carmelite habit. This shall be a privilege for you, and for all Carmelites. Whoever dies clothed in this shall not suffer eternal fire, rather, he shall be saved. She promised. The brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel is a sign approved by the Church and accepted by the Carmelite Order, as an external sign of love for Mary, of the trust her children have in her, and of commitment to live like her. The scapular came to symbolize the special dedication of Carmelites to Mary, the Mother of God, and to express trust in her motherly protection as well as the desire to be like her in her commitment to Christ and to others. Thus, it became a sign of Mary. A smaller form of the scapular is given to lay persons in order that they may share in the great graces associated with it. The Blessed Virgin asked on the 3rd of March, 1322, that John 22, as Christ's representative on earth, should ratify the indulgences which he had already granted in heaven, a plenary indulgence, for the members of the Carmelite order, and a partial indulgence, remitting the third part of the temporal punishment due to their sins, for the members of the confraternity, she herself would graciously descend on the Saturday. Sabbath, after their death, and liberate and conduct to heaven all who were in purgatory. The confirmation of the Buddha Sabbatana was promulgated by the Sacred Congregation of Indulgences, July 4, 1908. On the 750th anniversary of the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Pope John Paul II wrote to the entire Carmelite family. He noted that two truths are evoked by the sign of the scapular. 1. The constant protection of the Blessed Virgin, not only on life's journey, but also at the moment of passing into the fullness of eternal glory. And 2. The awareness that devotion to her cannot be limited to prayers and tributes in her honor on certain occasions, but must become a habit which is a permanent orientation of one's own Christian conduct woven of prayer and interior life through frequent reception of the sacraments and the concrete practice of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. The scapular becomes a 